Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our evening Dhamma. I was sent a question today. Sent a question today by someone who lives in the area. This internet thing, no? Back in my day when you wanted to ask your teacher a question, you had to actually <laughs> go see your teacher. Now they just think they can Facebook me. Not impressed. I have to make the Dhamma a little bit difficult. You have to be... Can't be too convenient. You can't just pull out your phone and message your teacher. That's not cool. Well, you can, I don't mind. I'm just not going to answer. Instead, I'm going to come here and answer. Use it to talk about the Dhamma tonight. Because it's an interesting question. It's an interesting situation. The situation is... When we first learn about Buddhism, it's quite simple, no? It's quite a simple concept and some very simple truths, some fairly simple practices. It's not easy. We undertake to practice meditation and we find it quite difficult. But we see the relation, the correlation between the teachings and the practice. Yes, indeed, as I practice, I sort of start to realize the truth of these teachings. And I certainly am able to free myself up from some of the bad habits that I've carried around. I'm able to give up my addictions and so on. And I become quite confident and secure in the results that you've gained from the practice. This has changed me. You might even start to think you're a little bit enlightened. And so for a while you, you think your life has changed, meditation has changed your life. And then after some time, short time, long time, all of those things that you thought you'd freed yourself, all those changes you thought you'd made, begin to unravel. So suddenly you find yourself confronted by the same old problems again. Addiction, aversion, they start to come back. And you start to realize they were not really eradicated. It's an interesting case because someone can practice quite strenuously and uh, really change the state of their mind, purify the state of their mind, but But without the depth of intensive practice or long-term practice, most of the benefits one gains are, are temporary. They're the suppression of the defilements. So it's e what it means is it's easy to become, um, to overestimate the results one gains in the practice. To overestimate yourself and your attainments and your progress in the practice. 
And so in the beginning, it's one meditator put it put it well recently before he left. It's like it's like the tip of the iceberg. When you first come, you only see the tip, and you think, "Oh, well, that's quite big." <laughs> and then you okay, and you tackle this problem, and you you conquer the tip of the iceberg thinking oh yes this was a big th deal and then once you conquer the tip of the iceberg you look under the water and you see oh that was just the tip of the iceberg this is what the meditators here are, are realizing through their intensive hours and hours a day Through the course they're tackling the iceberg and, and by the end of the course they've finally reached the surface of the water and they've looked underneath and realized the, the magnitude of the problem. Because who we are, uh, who we are is just habits. It's a simple thing to say and it sounds like it should be easy to change but our habits are far more, far more, many orders of magnitude greater than we're aware. Spanning into past lives and the mind is far more complicated, complex than we originally understand. And so in the beginning we have a simplistic understanding of the problem of, of, of the depth of our, our, let's say, neurotic behavior or our mental problems. And we're looking for always the quick fix and so we think there should be some simple cure and we're hoping, always hoping that it will go away soon. And so at the slightest hint of it easing, we get excited and we begin to think that maybe we've made a breakthrough and now it's going to be gone and not come back. I think this is a big, um, well, a bit of a, um, a concern for, for people meditating at home on a daily basis who have never done intensive meditation practice is that it's easy to lull yourself into a false sense of security that you've somehow gained oh I've been practicing for years or so on and there's, it's not, not to uh, trivialize that of course it's a great thing to do daily practice and you will realize all sorts of things but it's also very easy to lull yourself into a false sense of security thinking that you've actually eradicated the problems and then be disappointed when they start to come back or when you find out that they're still there defilements are of three kinds the understanding technical understanding of how the, the mind works or, or the types of defilements to sort of clearly lay it out to lay out what we mean by defilement Kilesa We have the uh, the Kamma Kilesa, the actions, defiled actions This is speech and, and bodily actions that is based on unwholesomeness This is the worst, this is when you think of what makes a person evil or what makes a person do things that cause suffering to themselves and others we think of the actions and the speech the things they say and the things they do this is how we judge people normally it's very hard to judge people based on their state of mind because we're not privy to that so instead we are able to see and we pay attention to people's behavior so if we kill and steal and lie and cheat this is a sort of this is the real defilement this is what defiles a person 
It's not by water that one becomes pure. It's not by bathing. One is pure according to one's, ac one's actions and one's speech. This is very real. I mean, these are a very real concern for Buddhists. And so most Buddhists are able to, to some extent, overcome this sort of defilement fairly easily. In fact, there are a lot of, I think, cultural Buddhists who tend to think that they're following the Buddhist teaching just because they don't, they don't kill and steal and lie and cheat and take drugs and alcohol. Of course, there are many Buddhists who aren't even able to keep that, yet call themselves Buddhists. But it's not really enough. It's not really... I mean, this was the support. These were supportive measures. A person can keep all the five precepts and still not be free from any sort of defilement. And the potential to commit an immoral activity, to kill or steal or lie or cheat, is still always present. It's a constant effort to remain vigilant and to refrain from unwholesome acts and speech because the mind is still defiled. And so the second level of defilement is what's going on inside the mind. These are the five hindrances, liking and disliking, desire and aversion, worry, restlessness, fear, doubt, confusion, guilt, even feeling guilty about your defilement, this is more defilement. It's one of the unwholesomenesses is to worry about the bad things you've done. Now this is yet more real than the, the first type. Because a person can refrain and yet be full of anger and greed and yet refrain from killing and stealing and so on. A person can be sitting in, on a meditation mat with their eyes closed and be full of greed and anger and delusion. I'm sure our meditators here can relate. At times this is the state. Our minds are full of these defilements. This is what we wrestle with here in, in the center. And so this is what we normally understand of as defilements. This is the arisen defilements. And, and there's still a problem with that because when these are gone, we think our minds are pure and we've become enlightened. Well, it, it's, there are cases where people enter into states that are free from these, and as most of us do when we practice meditation, but then think to themselves that they've freed themselves from defilement. It's quite common in a meditation center to feel that way to some extent. You've done a long course in meditation and on the day you leave you feel quite different. You, know, you feel like you have no greed, no anger, no delusion. And it may be true that at that moment you don't. You're very mindful and no greed, no anger. But there's still something missing because, you see, when you stay at a meditation center, there's very little cause for greed, anger, and delusion. Sure, on a basic level there's lots, but there's none of the very strong instigators. There's no angry people or uh, attractive objects of desire. There's no pressing needs and duties there's nothing to worry about there's nothing to stress over and so you become quite relaxed 
and have a feeling that your mind is very pure and, and your mind will be quite relatively quite pure just by staying in the meditation center because because there's very little to make it impure you might start lusting over the food in the kitchen or uh, eyeing your bed with attraction or, or aversion you might get angry about the guy next door who snores or who who opens the door loudly or so on <coughs> but there's very little of any significance to make you really angry and so it, or greedy and, and so it's quite easy at times there still be many defilements that come up but at times it's easy to enter into a state that's free from defilement or free from arisen defilement and so the final level, there is a third level, and it's called the Anusaya. And I'm sure many of you have heard of this, and many of you have heard me talk about these levels. But the Anusaya are the, Anu means under, or, or mm, Anu is a prefix. Saya means to lie, to lie down, or to rest. So these are the underlying, or the latent, they say, or the proclivities, the tendencies. The anusaya means the the potential, potential for defilement. And there are a whole list of these, in some places there are five, in other places there are seven. It's not really important what they are, I mean, I can list them, but it's, 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 you miss the point if you list them, or if you focus too much on the list. There's Kamaraga, which is desire for sensuality. There's Patiga, which is aversion. And these are the bases for greed. The base, the underlying kernel, the root for greed and anger. Then there's Diti and Mana. Diti, which is views. Mana, which is conceit. Vichikicha, which is doubt. Uh, Bhavaraga, there's desire for becoming, so ambitions and so on. And avidya, which is ignorance. But none of these are should be understood as the arisen defilement. It's the these. It means these are the. It's the tendency for these and for all defilements to arise. It's the. Improper conception of reality, the ignorance, the misunderstanding, the delusion that that uh, the, that allows the potential for all of these things and others to arise, and this is what we're really getting at. Meditation, as I've said quite a bit recently, is about changing who you are, the very fundamental core of who you are. Much of who we are just has to be thrown out or discarded or discounted anyway and trivialized, minim minimalized, ignored, not given power. We, can't, no, we can no longer rely on who we are. Doesn't mean we have to throw it all out just because it's who we are or have we discard everything about ourselves, but we, it all has to be subject to, uh, um, to uh, discrimination, to scrutiny. We have to scrutinize every aspect of who we are. And change very much about who we are. And this is how the Anusaya, how, how our potentials, our potential for defilement is, is uprooted. And this takes a lot more work and is a lot more difficult than simply getting rid of the defilements in the mind which are momentary. So it's important to understand these three levels, to be able to di differentiate and to not be lulled into a false sense of security, to not aim only to stop greed and anger and delusion from arising, but to aim to change who you are and to really understand deeply the nature of our uh, habits, the nature of who we are, break it down and 
transform this being, whatever it is, uh, using positive habit forming, you know, the formation of good habits and wholesomeness in the mind. Through the practice of charity, through the practice of morality, through the practice of tranquility and insight meditation. And this is the most difficult task, of course. It doesn't end when you stop, when you achieve the state of no greed, anger, and delusion. It, it continues until you have wisdom, until you have sufficient wisdom to prevent any arising of further greed, anger, and delusion. And it's a big iceberg. So, a little bit of thought on defilements. And so this person's question was why these things come back when they thought they were eradicated. Sort of, I mean, it was a little bit different, I suppose. A little bit specific. But... Uh, that's the thing. Don't rest content just because you're able to enter into meditative states. You really have to change uh, quite a bit fundamental aspects of who we are. You have to dig deep. So there you go. There's the Dhamma for tonight. If there are questions, I'm happy to answer. We got a few online questions here. Does withstanding psychical discomfort, such as taking a cold shower, aid in meditation practice? No, because uh, not likely because it, um, it it Im includes the intentional cause causing of, of suffering, and so you know, it's counterproductive because you're creating the intention to cause suffering to yourself. Yeah, it's it's caused by impatience, you know. The, the, the even even asking this question is a sign that you you want to push the process along somehow, you know, to aid the process. There's no aiding meditation practice. You either meditate or you don't. And if you're doing something else, you're not meditating. I was thinking of doing a mock retreat. Tried meditating intensively, but got very disturbed. Well, you shouldn't really do intensive meditation. You shouldn't really do meditation, intensive meditation, without the the as a newcomer, uh, without the support of a teacher. It can be dangerous. I mean, usually it'll just, as you say, you'll get disturbed and you'll just stop. That's the most common thing, but it's not particularly beneficial without a, a, a teacher to support you. I mean, as a beginner, because you're 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 trying to go through a forest and you've never been in the forest. You're not you're not familiar with the landscape let alone knowing the way out. Once you've gone through intensive meditation through with a teacher, yeah, you have a much better layout of the land and then it's easy to go through it again. What do you think about an approach of avoiding bad and good, no, and the good will come because of the effort to avoid the bad? And a good idea can a similar approach work focus 
But it seems that when I focus on avoiding bad, good comes out automatically. Well, avoiding, th this is, um, you know, th speaking of tonight's talk, this is an example of a way to to free your mind, potentially, temporarily, of defilement, so you can avoid bad. But it's a good example of what won't work in the long run to actually change your habits, because it's avoiding, and avoiding isn't isn't sustainable. You have to work and work. It's sankara dukkha. You have to work and work to avoid the evil. And all you do is is build the habit of avoiding. And then when you stop, the, whatever you do to avoid un, uh, unwholesomeness, you know, is eventually going to come to an end, and then it's going to come back. So here's a good example: this person who, was, who asked me this question. Not the question just now, but the earlier question. They were you know, doing what they could to avoid engaging in certain addictive activities, and then, then eventually they just lost their the effort that it took to to stop, and you know, suddenly they're engaging in those old activities again. Avoiding is not the answer. Avoiding is not the way out of suffering. Four Noble Truths, that's what the Four Noble Truths, they answer this question. When suffering is to be fully understood, that is the path. And when you fully understand suffering, then you don't have to avoid craving or, or unwholesomeness. You abandon it as a matter of course, naturally. And that's all our questions then. So thank you again for coming out. Wishing you all a good night.